today's session, intervening with youth with intellectual and developmental disabilities who have experienced trauma is scheduled to go until 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. This training focuses on individual and system level interventions for youth with intellectual or developmental disabilities, that's IDD, uh, and also have a history of traumatic stress. So with that, I'd like to give you an introduction to our return presenter, Dr. Michael Gomez. There's a lot to say that we, we could spend many uh, moments of our training discussing it, but let me give you the highlights. If you would advance me to that next slide, please. Dr. Michael Gomez has been a clinical instructor at Bradley Hospital Lifespan Institute, a teaching hospital for the Warren Alpert Medical School at Brown University. He was previously director of the Adversity and Resilience Community Center, that would be our ARCC, a child trauma behavioral health clinic in Texas, where he was also adjunct professor at Texas Tech University Psychological Sciences, the Texas Tech University College of Education, and the TTUHSC School of Nursing. He was previously faculty at the Center on Child Abuse and Neglect, Child Study Center, Department of Developmental and Behavioral Pediatrics at the Oklahoma University Health and Sciences Center. With that, we want to say welcome back, Dr. Gomez. We're so excited for today's session and take it away. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Haley. I appreciate y'all. And I do agree with Shadana that uh, Jess is dope as well. So uh, so thank you folks for coming in. Those of you who are coming back, you've seen me before. I don't know why you would do that, but I appreciate it very much. And so uh, as Jess has said, uh, yes, I was uh, I have been an instructor at uh, Bradley Hospital, one of, it's one of Warren Alpert's, uh, which is Brown University's medical school, uh, training schools. I am Brown and was at a university, but it was the actual place in New England. So uh, today what we're going to be talking about is uh, interviewing with youth um, who have IDD. Um, I'll say IDD instead of the mouthful of intellectual developmental disabilities. And we're going to talk about what, we're going to break down IDD as a term because that gets thrown around a lot, um, but specifically who have trauma. And so I also apologize because I will be going on and off the, the slides. So I, that's why you all have the slides because I don't want you to get Zoom whiplash. I'll try to do that minimal as possible, um, but uh, just so you all are aware of that. And so, oh, thank you, Karen, that's very kind of you. Um, so this is me, I do all of this. Um, I'm also, I uh, have the great fortune to be one of the co-founders for the uh, National Child Traumatic Stress Network's Trauma and IDD Work Group. Um, it was formerly the um, NCTSN Autism Group of Practice, because a lot of us do autism work. Uh, we, we decided to expand because a lot of us were running into people who have kids who have trauma and also like ID, FAS, cerebral palsy, kids who are deaf. Uh, we can put in their kids who are blind. Um, so we wanted to make it a more inclusive. So that's up and running now. It's under uh, new leadership um, because the original founders was me. Dr. Peter D'Amico uh, over at New York City at Columbia, and Dr. Dan Hoover at Kennedy Krieger. Um, and we realized it's a bunch of cisgender dudes uh, running it. So we we realized we needed more diversity. So now we have Jackie Cripps from uh, uh, Massachusetts and Nova Evans over in Maryland. Amazing, uh, amazing people. And so, um, so um, we'll be talking a little bit about that as well. And so um, wanted to kind of uh, give you some of the goals for today. Also, since we're gonna be talking about all the horrific things that can happen to small children, um, look at the kuakas. See, look how cute they are. Don't they look like they exist on a diet of peanut butter and hugs? Or any of those like adorable little rascals you ever seen? They're so cute. Okay, because what we're gonna be talking about is how, I wanna spend a lot of time with Claude, like what do we concretely do? I'll thank you for the heart for the kuakas because they're so cute. I have tried to and spent way too much time on the internet figuring out how to smuggle a kuwaka into the United States, but it is highly illegal apparently. And so my lawyers have advised me against that, um, you know, and they have gone on record for that. So, uh, but if anyone has a loophole, just let me know. Okay. Like I'm thinking like emotional support kuwaka is what I'm thinking of. And so, um, but we're going to spend a lot of time on concrete skills. Um, I do want to spend some time differentiating traumatic stress versus IDD. And so, um, it's not it's not as important as people might think it is. You don't have to figure it out before you start doing stuff with the family, but there are some things that can skip you up, and we're going to talk about them. Um, I will look at look at trauma focused CBT as a good example therapy model, knowing that there are other great therapy models like child parent psychotherapy, parent child interaction therapy, ARC is another good one, Spark Focus, 
amazing models out there. Uh, so DBT is doing some very interesting work as well. But TFCBT, we do have some, some more current literature on what to do with kids with IDD and trauma. Um, and so um, th those uh, protocols are being written up as we speak. So I uh, wanted to not, not saying that that's the only therapy to use, or if you, have, if you can't find that in your region, then your kid with autism is screwed. It's just a good example. And, and you'll see what I mean when we get there. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is a, a resource I'm gonna show you in a second um, online from uh, the Road to Recovery developed by the Hogg Foundation in Texas. Um, Thank you, Colleen Hoover over here in Texas. And these are what they start out with when they do their two full day training on trauma and IDD. These are all the myths about children with IDD. So first, well, kids with IDD, I mean, they, they really can't engage with Freeman. They just kind of don't have the you know level to do it, flat out wrong. Um, well, if you're doing CBT or stuff like that, uh, it's just ineffective. I mean, they, they need something entirely different. Nope. Um, on the opposite end of that scale, uh, well, just do behavior modification, just ABA them and they're good to go. Nope. Uh, again, I'm not anti-ABA, but there are some significant problems that they run into with our kids. Um, and there's, you know, there's some other concerns with it too that, that have been put in the field even by ABA itself. Uh, the youth with intellectual disabilities do not experience trauma is a massive myth that I thought went away and I found out relatively recently, it's still pretty much out there. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this myth, the idea is that, well, kids with autism are in their own world, for example, and so they, it just kind of goes through them, they don't fit, they totally feel it, they totally do, they totally experience it. Now, they may not be able to verbalize it, but they 1000% experience it. Um, a big myth I'm trying to, to um, work against and why I'm here today is this fifth one. Working with this population requires the most significant specialized training. You have to have a PhD, you have to be a BCBA, you have to have, you know, an OT background. No, if you have a heart for these kids, you know, good child development, um, and you have some good intervention skills, and you can work with families, you're good to go. We need you, and we can use you today. And um, everything else we can train you up to do. And so um, one thing I want to um, go to go off screen intentionally. So one thing I want to uh, tell you directly is this. Um, I'm a product of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, a uh, product of, you know, a lot of the, tra we're trainers, essentially. We do a lot of training nationally. Um, I've done training internationally with World Health Organization. And so we at the NCTSN, um, we're, we're pretty confident we can train you on almost anything. There's, we, have, we can train you on almost anything, given enough time, resources, and energy. Uh, you want to learn PCIT, we can train you up. You want to learn trauma-focused CBT, got you. You want to learn sanctuary, cool, we can do that too. One on trauma informed care in the schools. Awesome, we got you. There is one thing, however, that all of us have tried, myself included, to train people in, and we've never been successful ever. None of us can do it, none of us. And here's the one thing, to give a crap. Sorry, can't train you. We tried, really did, doesn't work. So if you don't have that, then we can't train you. Um, but I'm pretty sure by evidence of you being on this webinar that you have that. I'm just gonna go ahead and say that. And so everything else is window dressing. So that significant training, um, we we can give it to you. I'm gonna talk about that. It's gonna be the rest of our stuff, but I think you all have that. And so everything else, we can get you trained in, okay? Everything else, we're gonna, we're gonna get you up. So we're not doing hardware rips, we're doing software updates, okay? Um, and so um, going back to the screen, also I apologize in advance because I'm, I'm looking through like chat, Q&A and all that stuff. Um, if uh, if I will promise to have question time at the end, um, but you can feel free to put questions in the Q and A chat wherever is comfortable for you. Uh, but I will promise to have question time. So if I if I don't see your question, <laughs> I apologize because um, you know my ADHD kicks in at some point and then I see squirrels everywhere. So um, the third to last myth: is challenging behavior explained by intellectual disability. But that we see that a lot still. That people are trying to say, oh, it's just society, it's just as autism. Well, that just holds a lot of weight in there. Like, what do you mean just autism? Like, um, it's, you know, it's not like, you know, my uncle's rotator cuff that just flares right up, you know? Um, the second to last one goes with the youth do not experience trauma one, the fourth one, um, like their mental age. No, they're, they're, they're trying to say, even if they have like people also talk about their cognitive age from like IQ testing, like, well, they have a cognitive age of four and they're chronologically 14. They're, a four-year-old can experience trauma. A, a two-month-old can experience trauma, by the way. Um, so there's no like lower age limit that, you know, you don't ever experience it. There is an age limit of memory and being able to verbally recall things. Those are different though. 
And so um, the, and the last one, as a psychological assessor, I have to work against the last one a lot is that IQ scores tell you everything you need to know. I'm here to tell you as a person who does a lot of psychological evaluations, I am one of the people who teaches how to do IQ testing. IQ scores do not tell you everything, whether they have IDD or not, by the way. Uh, and so um, and we're, when we get to intellectual disability in this talk, we're going to break that down more. But that's important to know that these are all not true. Okay? Um, if all you do, if all you get from this talk is these myths and being able to debunk these myths with the people you work with, um, then um, I'm OK with that. You can forget everything else I'm about to tell you. Uh, Jess and Haley will be very upset at you, but I won't. OK, if all you remember is these myths and you can debunk these in your day to day, then I, I feel like I've accomplished something very important today. So, and it's all about, obviously it's all about me, right folks? I mean, just all about Dr. Dillian right? So, all right. So when I start training, uh, whether it's a therapist, it's case managers, teachers, um, whoever it is, I'm working with um, peer counselors, um, people who are ABAs, I always start with the acronyms. These are so freaking many acronyms out there. So we're gonna give you a handle of some of these acronyms, okay? So I'm gonna throw a few at you, okay? So we're gonna have, FASD, IDD, ID, Run DMC, ASD. Okay, we're gonna go through those. Okay. So fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. <clears throat> There's actually kind of uh, a couple of categories. And some of these, these are still changing, by the way. These may be out of date as of today. Um, FAS, full blown fetal alcohol syndrome, means you have all four. Um, growth weight deficits, like the kid isn't as tall as a three year old should be, uh, they don't weigh as much as a five year old should. CNS ones really mean IQ. That's all it is, okay? And then the facial feature abnormalities, um, there's something called the alphabet scale that we refer to in those of us in the FAS world. Um, and it's made by the University of Washington. And basically from letter A to Z, the closer you get to Z, the more likely you have morphological features that are consistent with fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, it, th this may be old hat for a lot of you, for those of you who it's not. One thing is like a smooth Beltrum right here, it's smooth. Um, here it's, um, you know, epicampal folds, uh, in log there, there's something, and if you type in FAS facial features on Google, you'll see some examples of differences between typical kids who don't have FAS and kids who do. It's diagnostic. It doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean like they're less aesthetically pleasing. It just means it's different and diagnostic. Um, when I, um, when I was first told about this, um, like the, epi the the smooth fill for meaning this divot here where like your nose comes down, there's no divot, it's just smooth. Um, when I was told that, uh, one of my colleagues who, who trains in this with me, um, his mother growing up said that, um, you know, before you're born, an angel comes in the womb and puts their finger on your lips like this. And that's why you have the, the little indention. And with kids with FAS, that never happened, right? Um, and is when I heard that story, I ran home, called my mom and like, did you drink? Mom, did you drink? Don't lie to me. Don't lie to me. <laughs> like I free, I was looking at my face for like a solid hour to seeing if I had any different features. Uh, because in notorious for FAS is that those of you who work in this field, again, you'll you'll know what I'm talking about. Those of you who don't, it's pretty shocking if you haven't, like I didn't, because this was new to me when I started it. Mom drank a full trimester, kids fine. Mom drank the first two weeks before she found out she was pregnant and she missed her period. Kid has full-blown FAS. So that's why the recommendation from American Academy of Pediatrics and AMA is there is no safe amount of alcohol use when pregnant uh, because we don't know. Uh, the, no one's ever been able to figure out like, well, this much equals it because that's how it is. It, it just affects different wounds differently. We have no idea how right now. Um, <clears throat> so we say no safe use. But again, I've worked cases where Mom drank a full trimester, nothing. Kids, fine. Tests are completely normal. The facial features are normal. Mom drank the first two weeks. She was pregnant, didn't know she was pregnant. Full-blown FAS. And so, which means that one of the hardest ones is number four. Number four is actually the hardest one for us to get. Um, the, for those of us who work in this field, this is, this is notorious. Uh, I used to have work with um, Dr. Lana Beasley over at Oklahoma. And um, the running joke for Dr. Beasley is, like me, Dr. Beasley's family is Catholic, which means Dr. Beasley was always pregnant. Uh, so right, and I'm not doing every, I'm like, Lana, when are you not pregnant? And she, she has like seven kids right now because she's super Catholic. And so, um, you know, I'm not that Catholic. Uh, but the advantage of that for Dr. Beasley was we'd walk into a consultation with a family where there was an FAS concern. 
And if you're a mom, do you want to admit that you drink? Even if it's like, you know, I drank the first month. I didn't know I had some wine. I have no idea. Okay. No, that it's a very shaming thing. Moms get shamed all the time, by the way. Those y'all know this already. Uh, and a big part of IDD research and IDD history and psychology is let's not shame moms. Let's like, let's start, try to stop shaming moms. Uh, it took us till the 21st century to figure that out, by the way. Um, and so um, we, you know, oh, and also to your question, Juanita, why if you drink alcohol, nothing happens? We have no idea. We don't think it's genetics, by the way. You're yeah, that's a good question. That was one of the first things. Maybe they just got good genes. Nope. Watches out in the data. We have no idea. Genetics was a dead end. It's like, well, not genetics. Uh, by X to one, I just one this question. We know what it's not. We know it's like not genetics. It's not like the type of alcohol. It's not, you know, that you drank in a certain. We just don't know. We have no idea. Um, and so um, that one, it's a little, uh, Yareli, it's a little harder to kind of pin down like the before, before becoming pregnant. We don't, there's some, there's some lit showing. We don't think so. And other, it, but AMA is coming out with don't drink. <laughs> that, that's all, that's like their standard operating procedure now, which I'm kind of empathetic to that is a policy, like nobody drink ever, ever, just don't drink, just don't drink. Uh, and so, uh, because it, it's such a fickle toxin, essentially, we, we don't know how it interacts. It breaks the blood brain barrier in the brain. It gets in to places that most other substances don't get into. Um, and so it's really hard uh, to kind of pin down how the toxicity is affecting, which is why it's so hard for the literature to speak on it. Um, but Dr. Beasley would walk in pregnant, like, and she'd look at the mom and say, you know, and just start patting her stomach. This was amazing. You know, Ms. Smith, um, I, you know, I didn't know I was pregnant with Grace, you know, first month. I, and then they would just, you know, it was like law and order. She was like, you know, Olivia Benson in law and order. She was amazing at this. And they're like, I'm sorry, I drink. And, and again, we're not trying, what they think we're going to do is we're going to report them to child welfare. That's what they think. And we're not saying that has never happened. There's some cases where like, I'll tell you the last one I did, I'm like, I drank in, like I drank during my pregnancy and I'm happy. <laughs> like, okay. Um, and so, um, yeah. Oh, and yes, we can definitely use more inclusive language, Kelsey, I apologize. Um, and so, um, but you know, um, individuals who are undergoing pregnancy, um, they get shamed a lot, you know, for the decisions they make. And so all we need, the reason we need that fourth one is because, essentially, we can't give you the diagnosis, therefore you can't get the services, because if you have FASD, you you're then have a wide open door for IEPs when you get into school, you have certain, you know, uh, health benefits to, to address the condition, uh, depends on your state, but they're open, but if you don't have that, we can't give that to you, uh, so I we usually try to say it's more of a medical thing that we need, we're not trying to look to jam you up, for, unless, unless there is a reporting concern, but short of that was my real last report for FA for uh, parental drinking was yeah I'm drinking because I want to hurt my kid I'm trying to like they said they were trying to abort their child in utero by drinking and so that was just a clear report and so um but for Dr. Beasley for Miss Smith who she talked to we just need to know we just need to know just in case to do these tests to make sure that your child is safe and healthy and so um and so that's really the only reason we need that it's not to jam them up it's not a reporting thing it's a health thing uh, some of the ones you may see is alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder. That means basically you have um, everything but the facial feature, everything but number three. And alcohol-related birth defects means you have everything but, you know, uh, sorry, reverse that. You have everything but you, you basically have number two for alcohol-related neurodevelopment. For the birth defects, you have number three, but you don't have like the growth or weight deficits. Okay. Um, and again, there's a whole literature out there for FASD. If you're running into that, I advise everyone to, to look it up. It's the leading preventable cause of intellectual disability in the United, in, in the world, not just the United States. Um, now, IDD versus ID. These get mixed up a little bit. Um, IDD is everything we've been talking about and everything we're going to be talking about. ID is the new name for what used to be called mental retardation. And I know for this audience, this is probably, you know, it's just like, yeah, of course we know that. I still have to have this conversation. I still have physicians that tell parents and these parents then come to me and say, yeah, doc, uh, the, doc the, the doc said they have ID, but not MR. And I have to explain to them that MR is ID. That's the same thing. I still get that in, you know, in my practice. It's disturbing. Um, and so these are the three things you need. You do, it has to be before 18. 
Uh, otherwise, it becomes something something more neurological. Uh, you only see that with traumatic brain injury, you'll often see them having dysfunctioning, um, like adaptive functioning deficits, IQ deficits, but they but they have TBI. Um, and so, and yes, IDD includes learning disabilities too, as well. One, uh, one, which is why we expanded it from autism to IDD. Um, we, uh, since there's so many different types of learning disabilities, there's like a family of them. We may not, we're not going to get into that much depth of it. Um, but, but yes, that IDD does include learning disabilities as well. Um, now, one big thing that when I, that you have to have, you can't just have IQ deficits for intellectual disability. Again, the new name for MR. You have to have number two, you've got to have adaptive functioning. As a psych evaluator, I, I highly recommend uh, the ABAS, Adaptive Behavior Assessment System, or the Vineland. Those are formalized, highly normed, a lot of power, a lot of psychometrics behind them. Um, those are what we use to, so I'll use that as part of my testing in addition to IQ testing, and we need both of those. Okay? Keep in mind, here comes the trauma part, kids with trauma have bad adaptive functioning deficits too. Um, and no, no, that's right, Jennifer. ID is not based on IQ alone. It can't be. And, and I see that all the time, by the way. Um, I see people, I see psychologists, by the way, uh, basing it just on IQ. And that's a huge no-no. That's a massive no-no. Uh, and so, um, but keep in mind that adaptive behavior deficits, like, and when I, when I mean adaptive behavior, some of the scales, here's what some of the scales look like. Can, like if, it, if they're at the right, at the, that particular age. Can you put on your clothes? Uh, can you use the restroom? Uh, can you write your name? Um, it, it's dependent on age. So obviously teens adaptive functioning will look more advanced than uh, you know, a neurotypical 10 year old, right? Um, and so that's one, I mean, another way that these are referred to, number two is skills of daily living. Like how can they get around day to day? So technically you could have a 50 IQ, which is well, you know, definitely below the, the cutoff that you need. But if you have a job, um, paying your taxes, have friendships, um, you're doing well, you technically don't have ID. And, and I've seen those cases. Their adaptive functioning is doing great. They're doing everything they need to do. They're having a good life. Um, but again, keep in mind, trauma really messes up your, your skills of daily living. Um, and those of you on this webinar don't have to probably reach too far in the people that you've run across to see that they're not getting out of bed, they're not able to hold a job, and that's just even our teens, by the way. They're like they're not able to go to school. They're not able to fo focus on their homework. Um, and um, for the IQ testing, I um, also want to keep in mind that a lot of these tests are pretty rigid, uh, and a lot of my kids are pretty traumatized. And so um, it, it, there's a very delicate balance between I want to administer the IQ test to fidelity uh, to not mess up the psychometrics, but also know I got to traumatize kids, so I got to be adaptable and flexible. Um, and that's, I have my direct trainees do IQ testing for a whole year on traumatized kids just to get that balance. And, um, and so, and uh, when I say uh, trauma, the one I, can, what I tend to be talking about, the examples I'll use, Juanita, is child abuse and neglect, um, assault, domestic violence, community violence, disasters, uh, things like that. Uh, but neglect, for example, you know, traumas of absence can also be um, bereavement, death. Um, so those are kind of what I'm getting at for trauma. Um, so to achieve that balance, um, I'll have my trainees do a solid year of assessment. Uh, and that might seem like overkill, but then kind of vindicated because they're pretty good at it. And so probably not APA approved, but I'm going to say it anyway. So here we go, guys. Everybody ready? Here we go. Because uh, I had a kid, um, 15, 16, sorry, when I, when, when I met him, 15, when we got the referral. And this kid mom had been in a lot, a lot of domestic violence relationships. She was a former user. She was clean. She'd been clean for about two years, but she was pretty upfront about her use history. Um, he, you know, gotten some physical abuse as well. So this is a kind of one of my, you know, textbook kids. He was doing okay at school. He was like C average. Um, but yeah, I got the referral through the school because I was, I was working school based at the time. And the, the school psych there said, Hey, can you just do this kid's had a rough, you know, just a rough life, you know, rough, you know, 16 years. Just see, I th we, we just think something's there. We just think we're worried that, you know, what she was worried about, like he's depressed is what she was worried about. Um, so we get him in for a full day of that, full day or eight to five, <laughs> full day. First thing we do after we do like consent and confidentiality is we do IQ testing. That's the first thing. Cause we want, we don't want them like the end of the day when they're exhausted. We want to kind of catch them fresh at their best. You know, that's kind of standard operating procedure when they're fresh, okay. Um, 
the, the test I was giving him at the time, uh, one of the first items is, is on a subscale called information. And the um, the first question, I can say this because it's public domain. It's not, you know, Wexler's not gonna come send assassins for me. But the question is, you find a wallet in the store, what do you do? Like says, wallet in the store, some lights on the floor, what do you do? Now, the correct answer to that question is you find a manager, you find, you know, so like, somebody like who like an employee to give it to right okay that's great and based on that we either go like lower we ask you a simpler question or we ask you a harder question right uh, it's a filter question it's the first question of the entire iq test in, the, in that subscale so i asked that question here's what the kids answer is ready this is about 8 35 and we got till 5 p.m and ready this is you know also think of like kurt cobain looking kind of kid right here's what here's his answer well Society says find like a manager, a cop, or something. And that was, that's his answer. And I'm like, oh crap, it's gonna be a long day, right? And so I have a decision. I can be wedded and chained to like what the actual manual says, and you have to do it this because it was the right end, then we just move on. There's nothing wrong with it. Or I can see the bigger picture that I have a traumatized kid here and a pretty defiant one and make sure and look at the bigger picture, which is we really need an accurate read of how this kid functions. And so here's what I say. Is that your answer? Yeah, that's my answer. Are you sure? Yeah. Oh, sorry, man, that's the wrong answer. Take the cash, dump the credit. Oh my God, everybody knows the answer to that. You suck. Oh my God, you're gonna be doing so horrible at this. And he loses, he just starts cracking up, starts laughing. And then he's like, no, really, did I get it right? I'm like, yeah, you got it right. And then we move on, okay? Now, he had had IQ testing three years ago. His score, 105. Dead center average, nothing wrong. This kid had the highest processing speed, meaning how fast your brain works. High, he maxed out. He had a 149, which is like 150s is where you max out. Like when people, by the way, people who say their IQ is 200 are idiots. Okay. That, that's a psychologist telling you that, Pearson, who does IQ testing. It doesn't go that high. It's like, no, but nothing goes that high. Okay. Um, like, the IQ is 300. Well, you're an idiot. That's what that indicates. Um, but yeah, so he had the high. So essentially, he would like, he was in the like, super, like, like high, high, high average level. We communicated this to his parents and the school. He got into gifted. The reason he was so like grunge during school was he was bored. And so they got him into GT classes. He flew, he loved them. His school psychologist is like, he is all, oh, he's a different kid. Like, yeah, he has a 149 processing speed. This kid is, this kid is at step 10 when we're at step four. Like, of course he's gonna love this. Uh, he got into a really good college. Last, last I heard from him, he was doing great. Um, you know, very happy, you know, very like he's, you know, he's in academia, he's very happy. Um, and so, and, and I know, you know not necessarily IDD, but that's kind of the whole the whole point of that. When I tell my trainees that is we really have to balance this of like we want the bigger picture of what can this kid do. Okay. When I do diagnose intellectual disability, the first thing I say to the family, whether it's bio parents, adoptive, mom and mom, dad and dad, mom and dad, is the following: say, all right, uh, you know, Senor Sierra Lopez, I want you to say the following words to me. Ready? Okay. My son, my son is not is not stupid. Say it again. My son is not stupid. And again, my son is not stupid. And one more time, my son is not stupid. Okay, because that is not what ID means. It's not what it means. It's not what MR meant, by the way. Um, well, all that IQ means is that an ID, ID means, what intellectual disability really means is the following. A kid that age who does not have ID will do a task faster and shorter. And that's all that means, okay? That's the only thing it means, okay? Um, and so let's say you have a 10-year-old kid who doesn't have intellectual disability. It would take them maybe, you know, five days and 12 trials to learn how to tie their shoes. And with ID, the same age may take eight days and 22 trials. They can still learn it. <laughs> if you, you got to stick with them though. You got to stick with them, maybe break it down into smaller steps. You got to do more trials, but they can learn it given enough time and trials, they can get it down. And you can see very quickly why our education system falls apart very rapidly with these kids, right? Um, it's like, we got to study for the test. It's like, oh, that's a uh, bane of my existence, man. Uh, that's why I don't do school-based anymore. <laughs> like, work with school-based, they will never be my master again. Cause like, yeah, it's all about the state test, right? Uh, and you can see how our system tends to fall apart with a lot of these kids. 
this is why we have things like IEPs, like, you know, ostensibly to help with this, even though those tend to run into a lot of problems. Um, but this is why we can't just base it on IQ alone and have, have you seen the adaptive behavior functioning there? But IQ does not mean, like ID does not mean your kid's stupid, does not mean that. I make sure parents understand that. Um, and so, um, oh, good question, Kelsey. I run into that a lot. It's like, well, they can't learn that. I explain just what I said to them, and then we can do a soft approach or a hard approach. Uh, the hard approach is then, mom, we have to get you an advocate or something uh, because they're, they're viol a violation of federal law, not just state law. Uh, but the soft approach is usually a lot of education. I'm usually the one doing it, and I'm fine doing that. But there's something about mom saying this or dad saying this versus Dr. Gomez is saying this. I know that's a different person saying it. Um, and so, and I'm fine doing that. I consider that my, and when I train my trainees inside my psychologist, I say, that's, that is our job, by the way, uh, to do that education with a school-based team. Honestly, I'd say now that I have had the, like 10% of school-based teams where they just are like, you know, the, like last one was just racist, honestly. Uh, but uh, shocking how many BIPOC kids, quote, can't learn that. You know, that's like, wow, that's very fascinating to me that that's happened so much in this world. Uh, but I'd say the 90% of them I work with, they're kind of scared. They don't know what to do. They just really don't know what to do. Um, and so I'm like, okay, maybe Dr. Gomez, and that's the only time the doctor helps out in my job. Like the doctor's a liability because people are like, especially my family, are like, you're going to diagnose me? You're going to diagnose me? Like, yeah, cause you got chlamydia. Dang, that sucks, dude, that you got that, man. Like, so, yeah, that's what I said to my cousin when he asked me to diagnose him. So, uh, but yeah, it's a liability in my personal life. But outside of that, this is when it comes in handy is when I have those conversations with IEP teams. Cause I, I, can, I know I can come in with a different, attitude than a parent. Like I, I told the last mom that this happened to, I said, mom, your job is to be pissed off. That's your job. And you should be, because this is infuriating. I can come in with a different angle. And if the soft doesn't work, we can always go hard. Uh, and thankfully for that, that mom would I said that to the soft did work, but it was a lot of fear. The school-based team didn't, especially with trauma, by the way, what Kelsey just mentioned, the trauma will amplify that by 11. And because not only are they scared of like the intellectual disability or IDD, they're still scared of the trauma. They don't know, they've never like, they may not have run across this or if they have, they didn't know what they were looking at. Um, so let's educate. So a lot of education is going on here and I consider it as psychologist, my job to do that. Um, won't say it's your job, but I, I do consider it my job to do that. Great question, John's doing awesome, by the way. Now, again, uh, just to break this down a little more and beat a dead horse, IQ is the bane of my existence as a psychologist because it is so misinterpreted. Um, IQ is not one thing, it's like five things. So if I said, uh, hey Juanita, what's the definition of the word sleep? That is Juanita's verbal comprehension. If I asked Haley to solve a puzzle, uh, that's her perceptual reasoning, fluid reasoning, if she doesn't have to use her hands. Um, if I said, um, hey Jess, my number is 405-568-8639 and asked her that in 20 minutes, that is her working memory, okay? And my kid who had the processing speed, that's how fast we can do things cognitively, okay? So if I said, I want you to start at 100 and count backwards by sevens, the faster you can do that is your processing speed, okay? And again, it only means one thing. Like I said, it'll take you more, if you have ID, if you have a lower IQ, it'll take you more time, chronological time and more trials, more attempts to learn that task that a person without that doesn't, okay? Um, this is also, here's our ADHD knot, ready? Okay, for ADHD, it's considered a disorder of executive functioning. It is a, it's a, it affects your executive functioning, which is your frontal lobe. And here's a, there's a difference between IQ and EF, ready? IQ are the basketball players. They're LeBron. EF is the coaching staff. They're Poppy or Steve Kerr, whoever your guy is, okay? Um, players don't call the plays. The coaches don't run the plays, okay? And so th this is what this is where we get a lot of learning disabilities in, is that a difference between the, the IQ and the function and also IQ and EF can also play into that. So you can have, um, like to kind of give you an idea of how this looks, you can have horrible players, okay? And a really, really amazing coach, like, you know, uh, like over, you know, kind of not spring chickens over the hill, um, San Antonio Spurs. Okay, you can have, you know, just powerhouse players and, you know, coach just suck, Oklahoma City Thunder. Uh, you can have like, you know, crappy players, crappy coach, Dallas Mavericks. And then you can have an amazing coach, amazing players, Golden State Warriors, okay? Uh, and any iteration in between. And you can see how that affects learning, right? 
Um, and one of the most tragic things I saw when I would do evaluations in, at University of Kansas, and we do it from college students, was some people had LeBron James in their hardware and they just powered through high school and undergrad. They get to graduate school or law school or medical school. There, there's no way you can power through that. You have to have a good coach. You have to have strategy, like you know, to know what to skim. You have to know like how to summarize things. And they would come in making all Fs in law school or in med school and about to flunk out of med school or you know, of their graduate program. And they like two of them I met, they were suicidal because and then we found out, oh, you have a learning disability, but you just had LeBron James in your IQ set. <laughs> That's how you're able to power through all of high school and all of undergrad. That's it. Um, and once they found that out, that this is how this is the profile of their team and their brain, like I call it the basketball team in your brain, um, then they that's really helpful, right? Um, you're able to make allowances for that, okay? Unless you're the Dallas Mavericks, okay? And just know it's just like they're rebuilding your apparently for us. I just guess we suck this year, apparently. Um, and so, but essentially, I talk about that a lot because in ADHD, um, oftentimes we'll have people who have. LeBron James and Kobe Bryant in their IQ and, and they don't catch the ADHD till they're like much later down the road. And these people think they're just like losing their mind, right? Um, they think they're stupid a lot of times too. And then I have to say, I have the same conversation. No, you just have, you, we just need coaches. <laughs> uh, and so um, it, technically Allison there is, but there's some debate. I don't, I don't, it may have gone into, I haven't like gone all the way through the last TR, um, like DSM-5 TR, the new tax revision, but there's been a lot of conversation about learning disabilities, with when their executive functioning is impaired, but the tension is not like you're a, you're not in a like you're not kind of doing the classic ADHD moves, okay? Um, like you don't look ADHD in other words, right? Um, and that's a real thing. They just don't know what to call it. Um, the 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 big push behind that uh, is essentially uh, we're seeing that a lot more in um, in people who identify as female um, than who identify as male, and we're seeing that a lot more um, because and so. It, we, you know, we want to give that more attention now because um, uh, historically women have not been given attention in psychology. That's just a short answer to that. Um, and so we're seeing that. That's also, we'll hear, talk about that a little bit in autism too, okay? Um, but yes, that that is a thing that we're seeing and that we've been seeing for a while. We just kind of don't know what to call it. And again, for those, um, like, like I said it relatively fast, Allison's question was, is there a name for a learning disability for problems with executive functioning, but that doesn't have attention problems? And the short answer is, yeah. But we don't kind of, we kind of don't have a name for it right now. Uh, we technically do. It's like a long name. It's like um, you know disorder of executive functioning without traditional learning. <laughs> just just call it like EF light. Just say say something, man. Don't none of us will ever use that in a report, okay? Um, and so uh, and before we move on to autism, of course, we want to talk about the condition Run DMC, uh, which is the greatest hip hop band of the '80s. Um, obviously, these guys were legends. This has nothing to do with IDD. I just like to throw this in there to see if people are actually paying attention and y'all were and I appreciate that in the chat box. Thank y'all folks for paying attention to Run DMC. You know, Christmas is coming up. So my favorite Christmas album is coming on it's pretty fast. Okay. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Rev Run, right? Rev Run, right? And so um, now concrete takeaways for kids with I ID means that a child without ID at blank age would take X amount of time while I'm not trying to do a particular thing, but they can still do it. By the way, this slide is just when we end this talk, you can just cut this slide out and paste it somewhere and just, this is everything I just said. Um, adaptive behavior is your GPS for an intervention. This is for trauma and for IDD and definitely for trauma IDD, okay? Uh, I'm proud of you, Jennifer, for wearing your Adidas. Okay, you gotta wear your kicks, man. And so uh, one of the things they were finding out at Kennedy Krieger when they're working with people who have both trauma, like sexual trauma and ASD autism, is that our classic PTSD measures look completely weird. <laughs> Still give them, but they don't they have no idea what they, they can look flat, they can look like a 50. We have no idea. The thing that is actually responsive to treatment and intervention is the adaptive behavior measures, the violin and the ABAS. That's what they're using specifically. If you anyone has an ABA background or is a BCBA, they also do like they also measure adaptive behavior. They just don't do it as formally as a violin or ABAS. Uh, and there's some there's some other adaptive behavior measures out there. I like the violin and ABAS because they ask the most questions essentially. Uh, and I just like more data because I'm an assessor uh, at my heart. Uh, but looking for, but, but again, if you're not, if this isn't your world for assessment, one one really slick case manager, oh, I love this woman. She's one of my favorites. She'd say, mom, what would you like your son to do? I'd like him to get dressed in the morning, use the bathroom, brush his teeth and, you know, put on his shoes. 
right? That's a pretty mom thing. So that's what she measured from her entire interaction. It took them about almost about 10 months uh, to get there. But the interventions were all guided by that one GPS of put on your clothes, brush your teeth, put on your shoes, go to bat, like all that. She, it was just a listen. Every week she'd check in like, well, scale of one to 10, how's your son doing with this? And, uh, and it wasn't a linear line, like, you know, one to 10. It was like, one, two, three, two, one, three, four, one, one, three, three. <laughs> and that was the year. And it was, and she tracked it. And I was like, you are slick woman. I love you. She's, like, she's such a good case manager. Um, and so now the last thing for concrete takeaway, and I promise I will get to autism, is neglect really mutters, muddies the waters for IDD. And here's what I mean by that. So um, we had a kid. So I was uh, the lead psychologist, um, lead mental health for what we call the Jumpstart Clinic at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. Jumpstart is where we'd send our uh, foster kids where there was a concern for IDD, especially autism and intellectual disability. Um, so there was a medical lead and a psych lead. I was a psych lead and my medical lead was switched between Dr. McGuinn and Dr. Bax, wonderful developmental behavioral pediatricians. And so the, what we have on our list uh, on our referral sheet, we would have for our kids who are five or younger, a morning eval and an afternoon eval. Our morning eval, three-year-old kid uh, concerns with failure to thrive, meaning they're not growing, they're not high, and that was a concern, okay? They're concerned, they were concerned she had ID, okay? intellectual disability. And that's a pretty standard eval for us. We walk out into the lobby. Again, three-year-old is on a referral. And here's what we see. Empty lobby, there's Miss Darla, our front desk, and at the side sitting over to the chairs, a very disheveled woman, probably mid 20s, with a baby. It was a baby because it was in a baby carrier and just on a chair next to her. And we walk up to Darla and say, Hey, where's our, our three year old? She says, Right there. And me and Dr. Bax look at each other and say, This is a child welfare report. <laughs> like that, that's, that's neglect. That's just straight it like there's no way around it. So we walk back in to the, we had a team, we had OT, speech, PT, and, and often some residents, some students shadowing us to learn about our craft. We say, hey, we're gonna have to make a report. You guys don't have me and Dr. Bax will handle this. We're gonna, and our standard operating procedure at the, at the place, which is still my standard operating procedure, if I'm gonna report you, I'm gonna tell you I'm gonna report you unless it's gonna put the child in danger and we'll do it together. Now you can give me the middle finger and walk out, which has happened, but I'm not gonna, you know, I'm, you may not like me, but I don't lie to people, okay? And so, so me and Dr. Bax are going to go tell mom here to report. We'd like you to do this with us. We were gone a max of three minutes, a max of three minutes. We walk out, mom's gone. And like Darla, where's she? And Darla's like, I, this woman came in, talked to her a second you left and they walked out together. Okay. She's still upset about this. You can tell I'm still upset. Um, apparently I called her, I called the regional director of child welfare because I had her cell phone from a different case. Apparently the daycare had called child welfare the day before and the investigatory procedure, the you know people there were like, well, they're going to the hospital anyway, we'll just pick her up there. Didn't notify us, didn't notify campus police, didn't notify the center. Like, what did she like pull the gun or something? Like, you have no idea, this is Oklahoma, man, it's crazy over here. And they, so I'm still a little upset about that, okay? Because it put everybody in danger, right? So six months later, they immediately took her out of the home. It was a clear neglect case. Uh, and they put her in another home, in a, in a safe home, foster home. Um, six months later, we see the same name. The little girl's name is called her Janie. See, Janie's name pop up again. And me and Dr. Bax look at each other like, we're about to see some today. <laughs> like, because it, it looked bad. Like, the kid looked like she was 12 months old. Like, that she was like a little baby, right? We're like, okay, we're about to see. We're doing the Braveheart speech to the trainees. You know, we're like, we're pumping air because we're about to see some stuff today in clinic, right? This is a bad one. And so we walk out, we're like, got our game face on, let's do this. All right, kid. All right, guys, let's do it. About to do an eval, right? We're like, we're ready. We're like, Cree three. And what we see in the lobby is a little boy, about four year old boy, and a little like, you know, three, four year old girl in little pigtails. And they're playing together with you know, these little blocks on, in the play area. And then the caregivers are kind of, you know, orbiting the caregivers for the boy, caregivers for the girl. And we go up to Darla and say, Where's our kid? She goes, Right there. It was a little pigtail girl. And me and Dr. Bax look at each other like, no in way. And we're like, now we are, we train in this. We are researchers in this. We, we know that dramatic things in resilience can happen. We know about, you know, plasticity in young children. I'd never seen it live fire up until that day. And it convinced me that 
no matter how good the therapy is, I can be the best therapist in the world. There is no therapy that will hold a candle to love, caring, food, water, and shelter. Those basic bottom level of Maslow. Nothing. Okay, you can be Aaron Beck. Nothing to hold to the candle to that. Love the kid, take care of them, attach to them, bond to them, feed them, right? Don't scare them, don't terrorize them. That's the therapy. And that little, now we tested it. We still did the testing. She had a mild articulation difficulty. She talked th- th- like that. She talked like that. She saw a double because she talked like that. And <laughs> IQ was normal. Fine motor was normal. Gross, everything was normal. And the parent, the foster parents were like, they knew the kid. They got her that they won, but they, they said, they're like, yeah, we just like took her to the pediatrician. She was in the ICU for two months. And, you know, we were there every day. My wife held her. I held her when I came from work. That's it. That was the thing we told her. That's the therapy. This is what resilience looks like. This is it. This is what plasticity looks like in real time. They were kind of as blown away as we were because they thought there's something underlying. They were like, no, we are the doctors. We are telling you, you whatever was underlying, you got it. You nailed it. And so all the therapies I'm about to talk about, like TFCDT, things like that, please do those. But again, there's nothing that will hold the candle to the love of a human being, like a caregiver. That's what it is. That's what, that's what the real therapy is. Um, and so that's why we're so parent focused, we're so caregiver focused, is that that's what really helps this. And, but again, how we tested that kid at three when she came in the baby carrier, she would have bottomed out on every measure we had. Yeah. So as I'm talking about like IQ testing and EF and things like that, I want you to keep in mind that little girl, that she totally would have bottomed out on every single thing we had for that age range. But that's why one of our core recommendations in that clinic was for kids six and under, a full evaluation, IQ, speech, physical therapy, OT, growth, like everything, every six months until delays have come to normal. And for kids seven and older, every year until delays have come to normal. Obviously, that is not being done, but uh, we had a grant. We could we had the luxury to do that, but I know in the real world that often doesn't happen. Uh, but it's because of that little girl, because the, those, advan- those advances happen in six months, all of those advances. Um, so just as we have dramatic regression, dramatic, you know, impairment. We also have dramatic resilience and dramatic plasticity, especially the younger you go, but it never really goes away. So I also want, just want you to know that all these acronyms we're talking about, they're not as static as a lot of people may, may think. Now, um, autism is one that we hear a lot of, and this is gonna be a talk on autism, but I wanna cover some core things. Autism really can think of as presence and absence of things. The things that you know autism for is the presence. Like they spin, they line up things, they know everything about Chevy since 67. And oh my God, it would be amazing if that was it. But really what autism is often conceptualized as is a disorder of social communication. And these absences are so impairing, okay? And I'm about to give you some examples, but here's what I mean by social communication is often autism is conceived of as a disorder of social communication. Now, social communication is different from linguistic communication. So let's say I airdropped Gabrielle into mainland China. I'm assuming Gabrielle does not speak Mandarin or Cantonese, but if she does, I will drop her into New Jersey, okay? Now she could probably get around because if Gabrielle is neurotypical and does not have autism, her linguistic communication is shot, but her social communication is entirely intact. It's like, hey, um, what, how, the um, water, how do you say water in Chinese? I have no idea how to say water in Chinese. Okay, she could gesture, she could like talk, she could like make eye contact. Now, the quantity in which she does that would be there. Thank you for telling me. I never I actually really don't know how to say water in China, by the way. So thank you all, Dana. Thank you, Rega, for saying that. Because uh, I really don't know. And so I appreciate that. Because uh, I would be screwed if I went to mainland China. But the quantity in which she does that, like people, I have uh, actually several dear friends who are from uh, Hong Kong. I'm from West Texas. So we do a West Texas handshake. Like, hey, how are you doing? <laughs> they do what I call a gunslinger handshake. It's like this. Their, their body space is so much closer and it kind of freaks me out. I'm um, also a trauma survivor, so that doesn't help. But essentially, it, it's a quantity that we figure it out. Like, let's meet in the middle, right? Uh, eye contact differs depending on culture, uh, maybe even gender, gender identity. Um, that's all quantity. Well, we're talking about a quality, because autism is a qualitative difference in social communication. And here's what I mean in plain English. They've done what's called eye contact studies on kids with autism, and they've replicated these studies kind of a lot. So what they'll do is they'll have kids with autism look at a computer, like a TV screen or a computer screen, and the little camera's measuring where their eyes go on the screen, and they can track that. And then they run the analysis to where they did it. One study that's been replicated, they looked at kids who are tip, neurotypical, kids who have ADHD, and kids who have autism. Okay? 
And here's the scene. The scene is a man and a woman having not a not a fight, but an animated discussion. They're gesticulating, they're kind of talking. Um, and so um, it's kind of like how my aunts and uncles talk because they're Mexican. There's a yeah, <laughs> very animated, okay? And so here's a short version. Kids who are neurotypical, who don't have ADHD or autism, look about here and about here and it's the gesticulations. And that's where the weight of the, of the eye contact is. They're looking at those three spots. Kids with ADHD look here, here, and the gesticulations very fast. So where is a kid? They just look at it faster, okay? But they're still looking at the same spots. Kids with autism, there's an equal dispersion across the entire screen. No, they're as likely to look at the man's eyes as they are at his lapel, at the woman's shoulder, at her earlobe. It's also the reason nobody on this call has looked at this exact part of my lapel the entire call. Nobody's done that, right? Because it's not a social object to you. It's a, you qualitatively know that these, this is kind of my social, but I also have a lot of distractions here and I do work with kids with autism and I know this is hyper stimulating. And I, <laughs> I do that kind of as a joke. I like, I can blank out the screen, by the way. So when my kids are overstimulated, I can do that. Uh, but one of my kids with autism, like, dude, you have so much junk, Dr. G. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's therapy. That's, you know, I'll, that's my, what I'm going to say. I'm not just like, uh, you know, a hoarder of therapy. Um, but the weight is equally dispersed. And that and that's not bad. That's not impairing necessarily. But you can see how that's problematic in social situations, right? And none of you have still looked at this part of my lapel, have you? Okay. Now, if I've trained you five hours a day, five days a week, every week to do that, you probably could eventually learn to do this periodically. Okay. And that's something that some form, forms of ABA do. And I often know when I have a kid who has had a lot of ABA, because here's how they'll they'll interact with me. Hi, Dr. Gomez. <laughs> and, that, and we're not joking. That's really good, Amy. Like, you did a good job, man. Because a year ago, that kid was catatonic. Uh, that's in it, but you can see how it doesn't look super organic, right? And that's that's fine, okay? I also talk about what I call the comic con test, the comic convention test, uh, because people, a lot of times people think, and I do appreciate Jess's uh, comic question because I, I own more comic books than any adult man should, okay? But I am a child psychologist, so I consider it a tax write-off and I'm totally fine with that, okay? Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, and so people do, well, they're just nerdy, right? Thank you, Joss, I appreciate that. Uh, but he's just nerdy, right? It, no, you can have neurotypical comic conversations, right? Okay, and, but there's also ones that like, this is what I mean by a comic convention test, ready? So let's say me and, you know, um, you know, Jennifer are having a neurotypical comic conversation at a comic convention in San Diego, ready? Um, and so thank you, Kay, for yeah, there, I, I will put that on the audit, okay? Uh, but here's me and uh, Jen, ready? Jen, Superman all the way. Michael, are you high? Batman would like freaking beat him up. No, I wouldn't. I mean, are you serious? Are you serious thing? like a Kryptonian could take that? Yeah, because like in the Scott Snyder one and like, you know, the, the like New 52, you can see that he has a fight. Oh, though that's BS, Jen. You can, it's called, I call it the ping pong, right? You can see it kind of me and Jen going ping pong back and forth, right? Here is an ASD looking Comic Con uh, conversation. Look, Joss, Batman all the way. Did you know that the first appearance of Batman was in Detective Comics 27 with Bill Finger and Bob Kane? Uh, yeah, Josh, that's cool, man. Yeah, the, they just had like the thousandth issue of Detective Comics right before COVID. That was, that was kind of crazy, man. Did you know the Joker is based off an Italian film called The Man Who Laughed, which was been done in several different arcs, such as the 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 man who laughed last and the the Batman who can laugh most recently. That, by the way, is that person with autism. That's their way of being social. That's why I love working with them. I love them. They're like they're so cool to work with. Uh, that's that's what they look like. Uh, and it, it, that's, they're really trying to be social. That is what it looks like. And that's like, that's to me, I'm like, wow, thank you, man. That's really an honor that you're really trying. Um, and, and it is a little Sheldon-y. I'd say Sheldon has like way more social communication skills than most of the kids I work with. Um, and so, and because, and because again, keep in mind that person I'm talking to is verbal. Uh, that person is um, also wants to have social connection and social communication. So that that's the way it can look. Um, actually, one of my one of my kids with autism, one of my teens, said the best pop culture um, 
film that he's ever seen what it's like to have autism. If anyone's seen the Henry Cavill Man of Steel movie, when he's a kid and he hides in the closet in Smallville because he's so overwhelmed by the senses. That if anyone knows what I'm talking about, anyone has that clip, feel free to find it on YouTube. But there's a scene in The Man of Steel, which Henry Cavill plays Superman. And it goes back to when he was in school in Smallville. He was a student. I think he was like in elementary. And all the senses, he can hear everything. Everything's so loud and everything feels so, so harsh. And he's like super sensory sensitive. He, the sound is too loud. The, the, the light is too bright. And so he runs and hides in a closet and tries to cover it. He just can't. Uh, he just can't take it. It's so painful. That's actually closer to what it looks like, um, especially with kids who like who haven't had any type of intervention at all. Okay, um, one of our kind of jokes is like our, our goal is to get you to Shelby. Uh, that's, that's kind of our that's our goal post right there. We get you there, man. We're like uh, we're doing good. Let's get you like to MIT right now. Um, and so, uh, but it's really painful and it's hard. And on the slide you just saw, I I said autism as a cake, and this is what I mean by autism as a cake is. Um, You've never come home from the grocery store with your arms full of groceries, drop all the bags and you're like, oh my God, there's a German chocolate cake. That's insane. I hate it when that happens. No, that doesn't happen because like a cake, autism is a highly specific set of ingredients that go together in a highly specific way to produce a highly specific outcome. Because by the way, parents don't do this near as bad as teachers, right? So Dr. Gomez, um, Erica um, lines things up and I've seen her spin. Okay, I'd say that's a good thing to screen. Let's screen Erica for autism. But that's an egg and some shortening. That's not a cake, okay? Um, so they'll often pick out the presence of the symptoms and say that that's autism. And I've even had some teachers um, and child welfare workers say, um, well, uh, Marianne has autism at home, but not at school. And I have to explain to that child welfare worker that autism isn't like my uncle's left rotator cuff. You know, it gets cloudy outside, my autism just flare right up, right here in this rotator cuff, get a little autism right here. That's how I get, it's not like that, okay? It's how my uncle's rotator cuff works, but it's not how autism works. The old school way to refer to autism is a pervasive developmental disorder, and pervasive is a key word. It pervades, that's why standard therapies don't like, quote, fix it, is because it's so pervasive, it's a developmental disorder. Um, and that's a good way to think of it, it's pervasive. Um, but one, one of the big moments which I really, really get behind in the field of autism is that um, the idea that um, you'll hear the phrase, we're not broken. Um, and I love that uh, because for so long, psychology, I think, um, I think we um, have um, been very guilty of this, of uh, um, treating autism as a pathology, as a brokenness. Uh, and I'm going to put in the chat box, Eric Garcia's book. I've seen this man speak. I love this guy. Um, it, the title of it is We're Not Broken, and he's coming from the perspective of lived experience. One of the best things I've seen the field of autism do in the last 15 years is people who have autism being involved in not just the policy decisions around autism at the state and county level, but in how the therapies are made. That's a huge game changer from a person who makes therapies and does therapy is I need, because I'm also a trauma survivor, so our phrase is nothing about us without us, and I think the same applies to autism and IDD. We want, we want these individuals with this experience to be part of not just the policy part, but the intervention part, the assessments, the like everything we want. We want you to have a voice in that. And Eric Garcia, who wrote the book, I just put in the chat box, We're Not Broken. That's a big thing is like the neuro, like neurodiversity is not an illness. It's, you know, we're not broken. There's something broke about us. And so, um, and he makes a very compelling argument for, um, yeah, our, our world is sometimes mean. <laughs> like, just basically, like, we're just kind of a blood. Our world is kind of a jerk to us. And it's like, it's not that we need to, you know, um, you know, change qualitatively. It's that we, it's like diversity. We need to celebrate these diversities. Uh, one of the most eloquent people on this is Temple Grandin, if anyone knows that name. Uh, type it in a YouTube temple, like a temple you go to, Grandin, uh, G R A N D I N. And she has a, she's a horse trainer uh, by trade, but she's also a celebrity with autism. And basically she talks about, um, uh, so a good, actually that's a good one, Lupita, is the good doctor, it was starting to move more in that direction. Because there used to be autism gives you a superpower, like you can solve nuclear codes. That was weird um, and pretty disrespectful. But it's more of like, no, it's just like, this is a different way of seeing the world. And that's what Temple Grand, Dr. Grandin, Temple Grandin says, autism is a different mind. And I love that phrase. I think it's so accurate. And I think it applies to most of what we do in IDD. ADHD is a different mind. 
Um, that's what it looks like. And so, and as a person with, have you probably figured out um, if anyone has ever been to Buffalo Wild Wings, that is what the inside of my head looks like at all times. Oh my God. It's like, there's a football game, a documentary on World War II, CW Supernatural, taking prior right. It's simultaneous and I can't turn it off. So my ADHD kicks in pretty bad and it's kicked in since I was pretty young. And I just thought I was like crazy or weird. And it's like, no, you have a different, just when I heard Temple Grand, like you have a different mind. It's like, that's kind of cool. Like, I love that. Uh, so I will admit, I do have a vested interest in that ideology and I do have a bias that direction. Um, and thank you for sharing that, Rachel, is that um, some of uh, ASD um, and um, like, yeah, they're, they're like, aren't aware they have it. Um, and, and one way to kind of explain that is like the glasses you see the world through, I have ADHD glasses. <laughs> and so, um, and so um, people have autism glasses. And, and actually, thank you, Clint, for bringing that up. Because one of the big things about, um, and why I'm so like, at NCTSN, we are very, very, very invested in having people with lived experience on all of our committees. I run the trauma IDD work group. And because of that, we have two individuals who, they're adults who have autism. And then we have one parent whose daughter has autism and is, was in foster care. Um, and so a big part, especially in the adult world, like people have adult or adults who have autism and went through treatment is ABA traumatized me, man. And I work with a lot of BCBAs. And I think the most toxic response to that from the ABA campus, they're crazy. Yeah, let's let's just dismiss the traumatized person, right? <laughs> like that's gonna go well for you guys, right? I the reason I work with BCBAs, people who do ABA, is because especially the newer crop of, of people doing it are very concerned about that and are working very hard to not trauma or not be coercive. Um, and I probably the one Dr. Peter D'Amico, one of our co-founders at NCTSN for the trauma IDD group. Um, his big thing is restraints. That's where you've seen a lot of the traumas come from from the from the firsthand accounts is they do they put me in a chokehold yeah that make that means muster and so we're i think the worst thing that that, that i've seen from the not just aba but psychology by the way is say well that's that's just poppycock that you know we, we we're not even going to talk about that because it's so absurd yeah that's how you make it worse man uh like, that's by far it it's it's scary that it mimics like the conversation about domestic violence in the 70s and 80s it's like oh that just doesn't happen here right um, psychology is very guilty of dismissing people who gave firsthand accounts of trauma. And so um, the people I see, and you know, like uh, I'm, you know, one of the organizations I work with is Texas ABA, Texaba. This is one on their agenda for the next five years, essentially, is we really need to go in and see what we're doing as ABA people that could not just be abusive, but could be coercive. Um, anything in the cohort, like restraints is a good example, may not be abusive, but definitely coercive. And so, and I think the big thing they're doing very effectively in that is we got to get people who have autism on our, it can't just be a bunch of PhDs talking about, you know, all ABA and trauma, um, because then we were like, we're voiceless. It'd be like a bunch of men talking about women's health, right? <laughs> and so, um, and that, I think that's the better direction to move in. And oh, I, I will say something probably not super diplomatic and I'm cool with that, uh, but I was having a conversation with a psychologist and he he was basically, he, he, he does a lot of ABA and, and I think he does good ABA, but he was say he was basically closer to that camp of like, well, we don't like, we're doing help, we're helping people. They don't know how hard it is. Like he's basically going on the camp of like, we're not, I'm not gonna talk about this, it's absurd. And I said, dude, psychology has blood on its hands, dude. I don't even have to go back farther than like five years. We're the people who created torture techniques at Guantanamo. We did that, okay? But also medicine has blood on its hands, social work, law enforcement, definitely like, you know, CPS, like all of us do, man. It's not that if someone's clean and someone's not clean, we're, we all got this history. We have to engage with it. We have to. If not, we're perpetuating it. And, and as a trauma survivor, I am anti-perpetuating the cycle of trauma. Like that's where I draw a line in the sand for, for anything I do. And so, and now to his credit, he, he heard, he heard that. It was hard, but he, but he heard that. And, uh, and I said, yeah, and he, his question was like, well, how do I do that? I'm like, well, the first thing you gotta do is you gotta talk to someone with autism. You gotta have someone in, in, in a position of actual power that has lived experience. You gotta start incorporating that into, whether it's your board meetings, whether it's an advisory panel, I don't know how you're gonna do it um, you know, as a volunteer, you know, but that has to be a priority. It can't just be a bunch of PhDs talking about 
is this traumatizing or not? Because I know what you're going to say. It's not. <laughs> we're the PhDs. We did, we're fine, right? Uh, like, you know, no, it, it, you need to have that perspective and you really need to engage with it. It's going to be a hard conversation, but that's our job. We're psychologists, dude. We get paid to have hard conversations, man. Uh, why do you think this job is going to be easy? Uh, and so, um, you want to have an easy conversation? We're at T Mobile. Uh, like, like, would you like a cell phone? Yeah, great. We're done. Okay, so go there. Um, I'm pretty sure T Mobile people have very difficult conversations. I didn't mean to denigrate the wonderful people and sell people. So, um, but yes, it's the line in the sand that, you know, we need to have these, but th so thank you. I think it was Clint who brought it up for bringing that up because that, that was part of what I wanted to bring up in this conversation is the kind of the topic that is still very relevant. I think will be for hopefully the next couple of years, if, if we do it correctly, is ABA trauma. Like is, is that experience trauma? And the short answer is for, for several individuals who have firsthand accounts and have been very vocal about it. Yeah, it was. That doesn't mean it has to be though. It, it, we, we can change that. We can change that together. Um, so I will stop my soapbox now, okay? and we'll talk. So you're letting me talk about that. Um, so we talked about this about ADHD versus ASD, um, and the last thing I'll say about that qualitative versus quantitative. If you have a quantitative um, deficit in social communication, you basically have an atrophy muscle, and that's where you see a lot of these social skills training for ADHD versus ASD is more of a prosthetic, which is fine. Okay, and so um, the um, my go-to example for one of our kids, this is my, the guy who taught me most of what I know about ASD work is a guy named Zach Warren, who is at Vanderbilt, such an amazing educator. He does a lot of work on assessment. He had a postdoctoral fellow who's coming, I think, from Chicago. She had done a lot of ADHD work in social communication, so did a lot of those social skills protocols with, like, college kids. So she came to Vandy to learn autism, social communication work. <clears throat> First client she had was um, undergrad at Vanderbilt, and um, essentially, he, <laughs> she, in the interview, he's like, what's a social goal you have? And his goal, he was heteronormative, cisgender. He said, I like to have a girlfriend. She's like, okay, that, you know, I can say you're going to have a girlfriend, but if that's her goal, then that's, we can work toward, like, we can start working towards that kind of general area. So she did what's called a naturalistic intervention, which means you go in like the real world. So the student union and, and she, the protocol she had said, walk up to someone you find attractive and give them one compliment. That was it. Okay. Four weeks later. He's crashing, nothing's working. So she goes to her supervisor, Dr. Warren, my mentor, says, Zach, I don't know what's going on here. And he says, okay, well, let me walk, let me go and observe this. And the guy got permission and he's like, yeah, I'm okay with that, Dr. Warren. I don't know what's going on either. Okay, here's what he did. Walked up to a woman, like, and we call this guy the kamikaze. Here's why, <laughs> here's why. Walk up to a woman, you have pretty eyes. Women are very polite. So the woman would be like, okay. And no, he'd walk right around. Your legs are nice too. And then she gets up and she leaves the student union. And Zach's like, wait, let me see your protocol. And he saw it. It was an ADHD social skills protocol. I was like, why are you using it? It's like, well, it's social, social communication, social it's the same. He's like, no, it's we need an autism one because he has a qualitative, he needs way more structure. So instead of that, would work fine with someone with ADHD, probably. Uh, for with autism, okay, we're gonna have a very specific goal. Then we're going to role play it in the clinic. Then you're going to write down what you're going to say. Then you're going to practice it. We'll also practice the prosody, the tone in which you say it. So you don't say it like a robot, like some people with autism may talk. And so also we'll say, when do you, when do you exit? When you make eye contact, we have to break it down much more fine tuned. That's the autism one. Uh, and so, um, and he, he was fine after that. Okay. Uh, the last thing I'll say on autism, because I know I've I'm, I'm spent a lot of time on this. We're going to get to the treatment part is, um, that essentially um, we had this um, mom come into our clinic in Oklahoma and it was around the time DSM changed to like the five. So it became, instead of autistic disorder, it became ASD. So we're doing all these re-evals and, and this kid's like rocking, this kid's stemming. We're like, yeah, we're pretty sure she has autism, but we're going to cross the T's and dot the I's. The way it was set up was um, we, we would sit like here and here mom sat in front of us. The kid was here. The door was like right there. It was winter time around. It was kind of cold that day and our room was drafty. So mom, before we can say, she's like, oh, well, let me get her coat. And before we can stop her, she just walks out the door. She's gone a max of three minutes. By the time she, this is what the kid started doing. And the kid, mom's sitting here, the kid's just here, just rocking uh, her like backs to mom, but she's rocking like this, like hands like this, clenching. Mom leaves. This is what the kid starts doing. 
Three minutes later, the kid is shrieking. You can hear it through the whole center. Mom comes back in like, what did y'all do to my daughter? They were like, you left. And then mom's reply was, well, she can't attach. She can't form attachment bonds. In mom's defense, the last therapist that she worked with said directly to mom, your daughter has autism. Kids with autism can't form attachment bonds, which is 1,000% wrong. Okay, that's the right response. You know, yeah, <laughs> that's our response. So we told mom. Mom was mom was glad that we were saying she can, but she was still having her like, well, well she like she's just rock. She doesn't do anything. Like she doesn't talk. Like she doesn't hug me. I try to touch her. She gets upset. And I said, okay, mom, this is. I'm sorry to explain this. It's the only Texas way I know how to explain. I grew up in Texas, so have relatives in Dallas, Texas. Now you you drive down the highway and you see like a truck with a tarp and rope, and you see it you know tied down, right? It's like, yeah, I've seen that. Okay, <clears throat> they're moving. The tarp, the attachments that they have are secure, correct? It's like, yeah, nothing flies out. That is neurotypical non-ASD attachment bonding. My uncle will drive across Dallas-Fort Worth Metro with a bedspread, a blanket, like, you know, some like extension cord kind of, just whatever he can find. And I don't know how he does it, but nothing flies out. It looks like a hot mess, but nothing flies out. And that is ASD attachment. It looks very different. It's qualitatively different, but they still want you there. Yeah, her name, Natalie, her heart was still like a little broken when she heard that from the counselor um, and said she still attaches. That's why she was shrieking and you were gone no more because especially at that, the kid was like about four-ish. Um, no, five-ish, sorry. Um, and that age, it's, it's proximity. Proximity is attachment for that age range. She needs you close. Even if you're not touching her, even if you're not there, even if she's perpendicular to you, she still needs that. And mom, mom got it. She's like, okay. So she can't like, yeah, she can attach. Um, so kids with IDD do, I know, I know it's obvious and I apologize if it's super obvious, but I've had to say this more times than I can count in my practices, kids with IDD, kids with autism, kids with intellectual disability, kids with FAS, they can all attach. All of them can. If you're a primate, if you're a mammal, you can attach. Okay. Um, that's not just an IQ thing. Okay. Now we talked a lot about the IDD and I want to talk about the trauma part. Okay. And so, and um, the, um, oh, thank you, and thank you, Gabrielle, because that question about like um, teenagers with IDD and PTSD, um, and um, we're, we're going into that right this second, okay? So here's what I'm gonna talk about. Um, oh, and thank you, Lupita, yeah. So um, yeah, when mom gets on the phone, the child runs away, that's still attachment though. Um, thank you, Lupita, that's a good example. Um, please do not memorize any of this. I'm gonna show you, I'm showing you PTSD criteria for a reason, okay? Um, you need a trauma. Pick one, pick three, mix and match. But you also need a couple of other things before you can get actual PTSD and you need a month for it to cook. Uh, in the chat box, does anyone know why you need a month cooking time for PTSD? Why you can't just diagnose it 24 hours later? You don't, that's okay. So, so answer. Reason you need the PTSD to cook for a month? Yeah, it's a cute stress disorder if it's less than a month. Not like, cute. It's like nothing cute about stress disorders, but Allison's right. That is the name of me short term. Okay. Um, when they do the literature for children and adults, 24 hours after a focal trauma, 98% of people look like they have PTSD. Okay. It's the norm. A week later, depending on the study, it might be 60s, 70s, at about two weeks in the 50s, give or take. At about four weeks or a month, it solidifies at the low end at a quarter, at the high end a third, and then it kind of stays there. Okay. If you were in a, there have been many disasters. Um, the you know West Coast just got a hurricane. Um, Maui just got devastated. Do you think they're like having anxiety? Do you think they're having sleep trouble? And do you think that is completely normal? Yeah. Okay. So we don't want to pathologize normal reaction. That's a normal, healthy reaction. This is also why I tell paramedics that like, this is why people think you're jerks. is because the person screaming is like, yeah, Allison's fine. She's screaming. <laughs> But the person with like a metal tube sticking out of their midsection, like, hey, you want to check on Allison? She she sounds like she's hurting. They're going to call in backup because that person may be in shock. That's not a normal reaction, okay? And so PTSD is not the worst way to think about trauma uh, because it does cover some things, and it um, but it, it also covers some things that get kind of loved in the IDD. So like, look at the E cluster. This is, this looks a lot like ADHD, right? Like, you know, being irritable, can't concentrate, you know, a little fidgety. Um, 
avoidance can look a little bit like kids shutting down like autism, right? Uh, they don't want to talk, they don't want to be around people, they withdraw. And so it's not the worst way to think about trauma, but this one, it, we're running into some problems with our standard metrics because it doesn't tend to match up. And part of the reason is that this was all made on neurotypical people. Uh, which, this wasn't made on like, this wasn't normal like kids with uh, autism or IDD. Um, Dr. Dan Hoover over at Kennedy Krieger is doing a PTSD metric that is being normed on kids with autism. It's still looking like the same clusters, but they look a little bit different. So for example, we make it a regression is a big one that we see with a lot of our kids with IDD is they regress back to like maybe a previous problem. Um, we also see a lot of like increased stereotypies and repetitive behaviors like soothing behaviors. Um, if anyone works with kids with autism, they may stem like that, okay? Um, and that may increase during times of stress, which is, it's a stress response. Um, the diagnosis I like to show people is we're still upset this was not in the DSM, is this one, which is developmental trauma disorder. And so um, this one was, now the keyword in PTSD is trauma, traumatic. That's the keyword in that disorder, okay? The keyword in developmental trauma disorder is not trauma, it's developmental. This looks like a developmental disorder. So PTSD was originally made on veterans, like Vietnam veterans, and then was, you know, was normed on, you know, and, and used on kids with like abuse histories and domestic violence and sexual assault. Developmental trauma disorder was made with kids zero to five, especially with pre-memory trauma, like they were neglected the first 24 months of life, for example. Um, this one we're finding matches up way better with our kids with IDD because it focuses on the developmental, not just on the trauma. Um, and so we want to treat... The traumatic, if you think, and one way to kind of think of trauma is as a toxin, okay? And so that, uh, when I was um, in Oklahoma, one of my mentors, Mark Chaffin, was working with the School of Public Health there. And at that point, Oklahoma was trying to switch from a traditional medical illnesses like smoking, diabetes, cancer, to like social issues like child abuse, uh, poverty, things like that. We were there for an abuse talk and, um, Dr. Chaffin is talking about the ACEs study. If you're not familiar with the ACEs study, type in ACES CDC on Google space, like ACEs and then the space and CDC. Um, and so he's talking about that and how people with higher ACE scores will have higher rates of heart disease, higher rates of, you know, suicide attempts, higher rates of, you know, alcohol use. And as he's talking about this, one of the public health professors says, wait a second, you're talking about a toxin exposure. We're like, yeah. Actually, we are. That's actually what we're talking about, right? Um, PTSD doesn't tend to look at that. You get exposed, you know, then we assess and you have your symptoms. Developmental trauma disorder looks at it more like a toxin exposure, which is actually a really good way to think of trauma is toxin exposure. Because let's go back to FAS, right? Um, the one I, example I use is smoking because I am a former smoker. So I'm not picking on any of the smokers on this, on this webinar. I apologize. And yes, God, I still miss it. Every friggin' day I miss it, okay? but it's fine. And so I have a friend who my age worked in smoky bars before they passed all the ordinance. And he was an at-risk group during COVID. He gets bronchitis like four or five times a year because he worked for it. Before that, he ran varsity track in high school. And, but he was exposed to secondhand smoke for a year. On the other side, I have an uncle who is in now approaching the seventies, like certain generals keep dying. I keep living. Uh, I was like, Deal, dude, that's messed up, man. That's really jacked up. Like, yep, just keep driving like flies. I'm still smoking. Like, he smoked since the 60s and he's fine. Okay. And so, if you think of it like smoking is like that, it's a toxin exposure. Some people can smoke for like 40 years and be fine. Others work in a smoky bar for a year and they are, you know, have bronchitis five times a year. This explains something y'all probably seen. Take five kids, all are exposed to trauma, the same trauma dad assaulted mom. Kid one is fine, kid two is depressed. Kid three is anxious. Kid four is hitting everybody. Kid five is catatonic. That doesn't make sense for like a dose response, but it does make percent make sense for a toxin. Again, dose response is: I drink five shots. Lupita drinks five shots. We are equally impaired, all things being equal. Okay. Toxin is like smoke, right? Like alcohol exposure pre-utero. We we just don't know how to act. It's very unpredictable. Okay. And so the first thing we usually tell people is when they have a, 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 not for just IDD, but for anything, but especially IDD, you have trauma exposure, assess everything, <laughs> assess, especially IQ, adaptive behavior, get a read on how their traumatic stress is looking, but you're going to want to look at that adaptive behavior. The adaptive behavior is really what we're finding in the trauma world. That's our GPS instead of our usual PTSD measures. Um, in developmental trauma disorder, 
is really helpful with, with articulating some of these because you can see how a lot of these are not in the in PTSD, right? Like executive functioning. This is this one goal-directed behaviors, executive functioning, right? Uh, impaired capacity for self-protection, dissociation, inappropriate attempts for contact, like problematic sexual behaviors, um, things like that pop up. And so we want to look at the dysregulation pattern for these kids. And then, and then we can see what we need to address for that particular kid, just like we would if they had autism. What are the social communication deficits? So it gives parents like, uh, and kids a handle on actually what to look at. Now, just some of your data. This is our data slide. We're getting to the end, I swear to God. Uh, kids with IDD are two times more likely to experience emotion, like abuse, three times more likely to experience DV, and are four times more, they're more likely to be a victim of a crime and be a victim of victimization than they are to perpetrate it. Okay? These, these are people who are very, very, you know, uh, at risk. Okay, so we, so we think this is why, this is why we established a trauma ID group at the National Child Traumatic Stress Network is because of this, okay? Now, one resource I give it, this is our systems level stuff. I know we've been talking about a lot of individual stuff. This is our systems level now. Road to Recovery, we're, we're, thank you, Dr. Hoover and Dr. D'Amico. We're kind of coming up on 2.0. This is the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. It has these six modules. They're going to revamp these and add a lot to this. But this is kind of a good way to start thinking about how do I need, what do I need to learn about this stuff in the system? What do I need? Well, well, first thing you know about child development, IDD, and trauma, which is what most of what we've been talking about, how do kids respond? Also, what about the resilience? Like that three-year-old I told you, that was an example of resilience. How do we create more, not just trauma-informed, but IDD-informed services? And then all of you are also seeing a lot of this and going through this. How do we take care of you as our providers? If we, if we win the case, but lose you, it's a total loss. And to give you an idea of where this is at, come here, buddy. Um, <clears throat> accessing NCTSN. NCTSN accessed. So this is the learning center. I'm going to put the exact link. Um, you need to create a login, but it's free. We're not going to spam. Okay. Um, this is where you get, you can download the entire road to recovery toolkit. This is what it actually looks like right here. You get expert briefs. So like a dad who has a kid with trauma and IDD, um, foster, like someone who works in the foster care system. Uh, there was exposure in utero. This guy, someone asked that question earlier. Someone who works in the schools. You also get the actual slides, the facilitator manual. So let's say that um, Gabrielle wanted to do an actual training on trauma IDD for her agency. Gabrielle goes to the kit, downloads all this stuff, and then goes to the actual slide. And Gabrielle, day one, hour one, minute one says, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Road to Recovery, supporting children with IDD who have trauma, experience trauma training. Okay. Gabrielle says, this training is broken up into six modules. And these modules, are and Gab Gabrielle doesn't have to repeat it verbatim, uh, but she can. This also, here's what you say on slide three. Here's what you say on slide four. Here's what you say on slide five, but also this is for Gabrielle's eyes only. Like, who's in the room with you? Do you have a lot of social workers? Do you have a lot of physicians or nurses? Um, you might even ask, you have a more experienced crowd, how, like how many years of experience do they have? Um, you want to honor the wisdom and experience of the room. Um, there you go. And that's day one. She gets day two slides. She gets everything. That's all 100% free. And I do this training a lot. I have facilitators do that. Um, it goes through all the six modules I just showed you. Um, here's some of the, like, support support services, universal awareness, here's some of the things we do for complexity. Some, this is the myth slide I showed you earlier. Um, I love this one. Just as you are an expert in mental health and developmental disabilities, families are experts in their children, family functioning, and sources of support. That is all 100% free and always will be. And so I use this at the systems level all the time. I use this with like shareholders, legislatures, and it's been pretty effective. You don't have to use the whole thing, by the way. You can, you can pick and choose, but it is designed to be used as a whole entity. Um, for those of you who like, this isn't necessarily part of your wheelhouse. This is what all evidence-based trauma therapy looks like. First, you got to assess. We've been talking about that for a lot today. Now, this sounds obvious. Now, it doesn't have to be you, but some professional has to ask if trauma happened. Um, and there, what we get this a lot, well, if I ask about trauma, I'll re-traumatize them. Unless you walk in there with a loaded Glock 19, you're not going to re-traumatize them. You will re-trigger that kid 1,000%. But here's our counter, here's our rebuttal to that. They're already being re-triggered. Three in the morning with a nightmare, at school, on the bus, at Walmart, always at Walmart, at grandma's, at the birthday party, at 
they just have no control over it. It's completely uncontrolled and terrifying. So we're gonna set a trap for this. And we start with education. We start, with, someone asked about school, like IEPs earlier, this is where I spend most of my time. We do wanna give them management techniques. We wanna be able to help manage some of that stress. The direct exploration of the trauma, we want an expert to do. Um, and we and we don't want to, we don't want you to go in there just kind of like poking around in there. And that's a big mistake, not just for neurotypical kids and a huge mistake for kids with IDD, but it's also a mistake to think that they can't do that direct exploration. And the example I'm gonna give you is Dr. Peter D'Amico, uh, one of our co-founders for the Trauma IDD group at New York. His first case was a kid who was about 12, um, cognitively was about six or seven on a good day, um, had autism and had a lot of sexual trauma. Okay, by it was cousins who had perpetrated over a course of a solid year. He was doing great. This is his first case, by the way. He's doing great, going through. He's doing like the education, doing the stress management techniques. He, get, he gets to the direct exploration part and he says, okay, Billy, uh, today he's like so nervous. Like, we're going to talk about your trauma, okay? And here's what this kid does. I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. It's like, okay, we are done with your exploration forever. We're done. We're never going to do it because you're saying you don't want it, right? And he, he's done. He's like, I guess we'll find something that would just do skills training forever. And um, and so which was the right move in the session. Two weeks later, three weeks later, sorry, mom comes up to Dr. D'Amico and says, hey, Dr. D'Amico, we love you, man. Um, and you're doing a great job. Would, I'm just wondering, in my son's asking, well, why haven't you asked him about the trauma? Why haven't you talked about his trauma? And Pete says, like, well, I did the session. And he said, I don't want it. I don't want it. Take one guess what this kid said during his rape. Don't want it. Don't want it. The thing that he needed to communicate was, Dr. D'Amico, I didn't want it. I didn't want this. That was it. That was his direct aspiration. Had he said that before? Yeah. Had mom validated? Yeah. But he, yes, right, Gabriel, like, oh no, like, yeah. That's what he needed. To, it, so we don't need, we're not forensic. We don't need like a forensic interview. We don't need a police report. The, a big rule for, for trauma there, especially for that there, direct exploration, being heard, being recognized is the opposite of being traumatized. What do they need to hear? What do they need told? What do they need to say? What do they need someone to hear from that, from their experience? And that's what he needed. And so he did, he put in big letters, I didn't want it. He drew a picture. Uh, again, he's like six, seven cognitively. So it looks like a seven-year-old. And it kind of is. And it's like, it's um, he had like just a room and then the two boys stick figures and then him and he was crying. And he wrote, I didn't want it in big letters. And that was it. That was his trauma narrative. Okay? Um, and it, it went really well. And that's what he needed. He wanted mom, mom to say that. Okay. He wanted mom to hear that. Like, I know. And mom was a rock star. It's like, baby, I know you didn't want it, baby. I know. I know. I know you. And that was it. That was it there. That was a direct exploration. Okay. And it, so it doesn't have to look like, you know, they write pages and pages or do it. Look, it doesn't have to look like a forensic interview. If it does, fine, but that's not necessarily what we're meaning by direct exploration. You'll notice too, that the biggest thing, and in Peter's case, that was huge, was the inclusion of the caregiver. Okay. But yes, that's right. He used his voice. He did. That's, he wanted his voice heard. Now, I usually tell, especially like, uh, court, like CASAs, GALs, like, you know, attorneys, if you want to ask one question to know if any therapy, not just their trauma therapy is evidence-based or not, it actually has science behind it, ask the therapist this question. What are you doing with the care, not the parent, with the caregiver, whether it's foster parent, bio parent, mom and mom, dad and dad, grandparent, what are they doing? Like, how are you including them in a real way? And if they hesitate on that question, it's probably not evidence-based. doesn't mean they're harming them per se, it just means probably not good. And so, because what we're finding from our, like, John, there's a guy at Harvard, John Weiss, who asked very, very simple questions that are very hard to answer. And one question he asked is, what makes child therapy work? Super simple question, ridiculously hard to answer. Okay? And he looked at everything. Is it PhD or master's, inpatient or outpatient, twice a week or once a week, school? And he found that the strongest single predictor for therapeutic change, if a child gets better in therapy or not, or... ADHD, ODD, major depressive disorder, anxiety, PTSD, ASD, pediatric obesity, medication compliance, and a bunch of other things is caregiver. So probably didn't need a PhD to tell you that, right? 168 hours in the week, I would see your kid one pretty arrogant and disrespectful thing. I have to fix your kid in an hour. That's pretty arrogant, right? More important is I dump my collective wisdom into your brain 
because you're the most important person. You're the, like Shandana said, you're the most important relationship. Okay. I am a scaffold on a building. You are the actual foundation. We need you. So I usually tell parents, you're not the problem, you're the solution. Can't do it without you. If LeBron doesn't play at peak capacity, we don't go to playoffs, do we, huh? We don't go to playoffs this year, huh? Do we, Ravon? Yeah, way to go, bud. Uh, money on that game too, man. Uh, and so, yeah. And also, like Janana said, you can also use a lot of the modalities throughout this process. Art, well, like my, I'm not very artsy, but my therapists who are play therapists who have like art therapy background, like back that in on the flatbed truck, man. We can totally use all that stuff. Um, and this is how we use it. So this is the actual TFCBT model. Call it practice. You you can you can switch things. Like if a kid needs emotion work, affect work first, that's fine to do before psychoeducation. Um, but we don't want to switch phases. We never, ever, 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 ever talk about the trauma first. Okay? If the kid's directly asking, of course we will. But what we need to do is we need to wait to have some skills, some stress management skills before we, we need some cardio before we run the marathon. Now, the model doesn't change, but the proportion changes for IDD. And this is what the current iteration looks like. This article should be was going to be published this year, but thank you, COVID. Uh, should be published in 24. And what you notice is instead of like 15 sessions, we kind of double it, like, you know, 25 to 30. And with a lot of my IDD kids, I don't do the 15 minute hour. I'll do two 30 minute sessions a week. Uh, even my teens, I'll do like Monday, you know, four to four thirty. Thursday, you know, five to five thirty. Okay, because it, it's it, I've had really good therapists have like Michael. I have a 12 year old with autism, and I only got 35 minutes out of him. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I'm like, how did you do that? I got 25 out of my 13 year old, and I was hustling, man. You must be awesome at your job. Uh, like, yeah. And so instead of doing a third, 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 we do a half. We spend a lot of time on that parenting, psychoeducation, relaxation, coping, stabilization. We spend half of the model on that. And then we do like that. That kid's a good example. Like, I didn't want it. That didn't take eight months. Okay. That didn't take six months. That took a couple sessions, but really, that what we needed to know what he needed to be heard. And we did a conjoint session after that, that green part. So we can still do all of these things. We just want to make sure we sequence them slightly here. The biggest thing I should, and this is probably one of the take homes is Dr. Thank you, Dan. This is Dan created this, he called it the matrix. This is an actual 12 year old kid with autism and sexual trauma. This is the whole model. This is basically the last thing in the box is what worked. So like right here, affect rate. And so the Y axis is what you just saw here, the practice acronym. The X axis is this kid's neurodiversity profile, differences and challenges. And so, so let's say that um, Jennifer has a 13 year old with ID. She may have five boxes on this X axis. You know, like, you know, Jocelyn may have three, you know, Haley may have seven, but whatever model, th by the way, if you have training in DBT, then this Y axis becomes interpersonal effectiveness, mindfulness, emotion regulate. If you have training in acceptance commitment therapy, it becomes like, you know, creative helplessness, you know, cognitive diffusion. If you have training in PCI, like whatever your model is, this Y axis changes. So we can map this on pretty much any therapy we know of. Uh, but we got to make sure to work not not just with the parent, but also with the kid about what their neurodiversity challenges, working with the kid, the school, the parent. And for this kid, their neurodiversity profile was they had verbal language was not their friend. They had some visual spatial issues. They were not motivated and they could not generalize. And so if you look at this one, affect regulation, verbal comprehension, emotions game app didn't work. Emoji chart didn't work. We should have just done zones of deregulation first. Right here, psychoeducation for generalization. As soon as we talked to the school and the child welfare worker, we were good. We didn't need a second one. Relaxation, pizza breathing didn't work. So noodle practice worked next. So basically, we this is if anyone's an OT out there on the Zoom or a speech path, if this looks real familiar, it's because we straight stole it from you guys. Uh, this is what like an OT would do for their lesson plan. Uh, when a kid's having like trouble with grip or trouble with fine motor, they would have like what they need them to do. Uh, like, you know, write their name and then they would have the challenge and they would just hypothesis test. And so we can do this with anything you do. And so, but we kind of stole it from occupational therapists and speech paths. Um, and so essentially th this is the entire therapy case at the end of therapy. So um, if it's like session one, only the first row, like psychoeducation parenting would have been filled in with one, basically Dr. Hoover would have been trying out books and stories, behavior charts, visual schedule, and providing psychoeducation to the school. 
that would have been session one. Session like 15 would have been like maybe we're at the trauma narrative. So we've done all this, but the rest of them would have been blank. Um, and so this is a way for us to kind of think through how do we deliver effective therapy tailored to this kid. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> I've been talking a lot about um, right, uh, if the, especially with development, their cognitive age might be lower. And a lot of times people think like, well, you can't do CBT on a kid who's like three or four. Uh, would people like to see what CBT on a four-year-old looks like? Does everyone want to see that? I think actually this kid might be three, three and a half. Does anyone want to see that? All right. I'm going to show you the best CBT I've ever seen in my career with a kid who is about think, three and a half. Okay. By far the best CBT. Ready? Here we go. We got to tell mommy when you need to pee. Tell mommy when you need to poop. Tell mommy when you need to pee. Tell mommy when you need to poop. We need to pee pee. On your party. We got to poop poop. On your party. We got to pee pee. On your party. We got to poop poop. On your party. You got to tell mommy when you need to pee. Tell mommy when you need to poop. Tell mommy when you need to pee. Tell mommy when you need to poop. We got a pee pee. In the party. In the party. Got a poop poop. In the party. In the party. We got a pee pee. In the party. Got a poop poop. In the party. Tell mommy when you need to pee. Tell mommy when you need to poop. Tell mommy when you need to pee. Tell mommy when you need to poop and then you get a prize and then you get a prize and then you get a prize yay Jenea. and then you get a prize right, cool. so, a few things about that clip first that is the cutest freaking kid i've ever seen and i will have words with anyone who says otherwise okay second i didn't see a triangle in there i didn't see a worksheet why is that cbt like in the chat box why why is it cbt what makes that CBT? I didn't see any worksheets. I didn't see any triangle in there. What made that CBT? Why am I saying that's good CBT? Yeah, there was a consequence, right, Clem? Yeah, there's like, you get, then you get a prize, right? <laughs> yeah, so the consequence is there. Like, what happens after your action? Well, there were cognitions, right? We call that a mantra, right? Tell mommy that you're there. There was definitely emotions, right? Um, I can argue that, especially those of you who are parents, um, I, in full disclosure, I do not have any children, to my knowledge. Uh, but those of you who are parents, uh, I can prove to you that you all have done CBT at some point in your child's lifespan. Ready? Clean up, clean up, everybody clean up. Right, it's in your head now, right? Uh, and so, yeah, that's CBT. Like you're doing a mantra, you call it a mantra, yeah. And so for our kids with IDD, especially when their functioning is lower, this is what it looks like. This is one, one of my colleagues used this uh, for a kid, a uh, 10-year-old with autism. I have been asked this question. This is not his actual brother. It's a stock photo. Uh, so is it like, oh my God, you got a picture of his brother, right? Um, and so, yeah, repetition, Liliana. And so basically he said, when your brother misses the bus, he has an idea and he thinks, hmm, let me call mom. That's the idea. Mom takes him and he's happy. This kid also had a cat, this kid 10 year old with autism, who's great. And so that's what he does. But when you miss the bus, you act like Morris. And Morris has a little alarm in his brain, his little almond shape right here. We call it a fire alarm. And when it goes off, he can't do anything. You've seen Morris when his fire alarm goes off, he can't do anything. And that's why you cry. It's not because you're bad. Nothing's wrong with you. Just that your alarm went off. And we're just going to work on your alarm. And so one phrase you'll also hear me, and I'll get you guys promise I'm getting to them, is don't close any doors you don't have to. Because I'll hear this a lot of parents like, you know, what do, do they, can they go to college? Can they go? No, like don't close any doors you don't have to. Um, I'll often tell um, um, when they get older, because we because our kids do age. I know that's a surprise. But there's a joke in psychology. Apparently in, in academia, kids with autism don't get any older than eight. Uh, <laughs> apparently they stop aging at eight because that's when the lid starts going downhill, right? There's like, you know, teenagers with autism, there's nothing out there. Uh, but you get like five girls with autism, there's like tons of articles. And so that's kind of the joke in academia is like, yeah, they stop, kids with autism stop aging at eight years old. They never get any older than eight, uh, according to psychology literature. Um, and so I, I tend to work with transition age. And so um, short version is they'll be okay, right? Now for your parents who are uh, caregivers who are way more anxious, I say mom and dad, I tend to see three types of problems. I do this at 
every feedback section, okay, every session is mom, I see, let's say we're talking about autism, for example. There's three types of problems. First one is strep throat. Take a pill, you're fine. Your son does not have that type of problem, and I'm sorry. Second type of problem is stage four lymphoma. Uh, your son's terminal. Uh, best we can do as medical providers is make them comfortable. But I think there's some days, mom and dad, you think your son does have that problem. He doesn't. He has a third type. He has diabetes. Okay. I use diabetes mindfully because apparently every male member of my family gets diabetes. And so my PCP said, let's make sure you're 60 and not 40 when you get it. And I, I'll take that deal. But <laughs> my genetics are junk. Okay. And I'm fine with that. And so, um, so I have the spectrum of diabetes in my family is have three uncles who went blind, lost limbs and died within two years of being diagnosed with diabetes. I'm going to drink what I want. I'm going to smoke what I want. Like, yeah, Theo, you can, man. You got like a ticking time bomb in your chest, man. And they did. Like, that's what happened. On the other end, my uncle, Junior, who uh, turns um, 80 this um, this December, like very active. He built a fence for his uh, great, great granddaughter, like, you know, just like a couple months ago before the heat hit. I almost kill this man with cake every time I see him. Like, Theo, you get a stress. Let's him. He told me his like, Oh, crap, you got diabetes. Sorry. <laughs> he, he, had, he managed it so freaking well, right? He got diagnosed 60 on the nose, and that first year or two sucked. He had to get on alcohol, couldn't like smoke anymore, had to work out. Like it was hard for a year or two. And now it's invisible, right? And he could, like, again, I try to kill him with cake. I don't mean to, but uh, it's just he managed it so well. And so I tell parents like, can you have autism and get married? Yes, you can. You can have autism and go to college. You can have ID and have a happy life. You can have FAS and you know be a good citizen. These are not mutually exclusive. So don't close any doors unless you absolutely unequivocally have to. And the reason I use that metaphor is you don't know if a door is open or closed until you try it, right? So let's give it a shot. Uh, thankfully, there, especially with pe more people with lived experience of IDD in positions of like voices, um, the essentially this is happening more. There's more services for this, especially in college. There's a lot more now than there were even 10 years ago. Uh, and I appreciate that, Shandana, about the metaphors, uh, because I speak in metaphor and I apologize for that, but I kind of don't apologize because my goal is to be so famous one day that I can mix my metaphors and nobody actually pays attention to that. Like, you know, Liliana, you can lead a horse to water, you can't get that bird out of that bush. That didn't make any sense. I got it, Lil. Dr. G's deep. Man, D, I got that, Liliana. I got like, no, that was gibberish, man. Like, but I'm not that famous today, but one day I will be that famous. So I think, um, but um, one day, not today. And so don't close any doors. You don't have to. Like the worst case scenario they have is they have diabetes. They just have to manage this their whole life. Um, and yeah, I, you know, I got ADHD, right? We have our own thing. Yeah, that's where the, the bigger conversation now that's happening in the field of trauma and IDD is intersectionality. I know that's probably an older conversation in a lot of other places. We're just catching up to that. So like, yeah, you can have like autism and also be LGBTQIA, right? <laughs> and so like, oh yeah, that can happen. Like, yeah, so we're getting more attention to that now. So the intersectionality conversation is coming more online now. And I think it's making it a much richer and also giving us a lot more ideas of how not to close doors essentially. And I'm so happy about that. I think we're moving in a better direction now than we have been in a while. Um, now, they will be fine only if we include the caregiver. Now, I don't mean the abusive caregiver. I mean the adult, the site who spends the most time with them that actually cares about them. Um, and we need, we need, we need somebody, right? And um, and I, you know, when they don't have that person, that's really hard. Not impossible to get them through. So, man, it's so hard. And I used to, have, I have a colleague who used to do a talk called "One Person, One Moment, uh, One Life." And essentially, those you've heard these stories where people have. Um, you know, yeah, I was, you know, at the bottom of the barrel, man. I was, you know, wanting to relapse again. And I just, you know, walked into church, man. I saw the pastor and he turned my life around, right? Even stuff like that, you know, and if you're that one person, then you're that one person and that's okay. But we want them to know that, they, you know, when we have someone supporting you, that's what really makes people that three-year-old who had a foster family that loved her and fed her, that changed her life in the literal way. Now, the last thing I want to end on is um, my philosophy of therapy, because I know I've been talking about the therapist. So I talk about therapy a lot. Um, and it's weird to me that people don't do this. And I'm going to do this the fast way because I know I'm running out of time for questions and I apologize. Uh, hopefully I've been able to answer some of your questions on the chat box and on the Q&A part. Um, and so 
fastest way I know how to describe my philosophy of therapy is as follows. Um, I don't know if I've told anyone this, but I'm first generation. Um, um, first in my family to go to college, me and my brother. Uh, in my family, if you don't go to prison, you hit the mountaintop. So I overshot a tiny bit. And so um, the um, one, uh, one, one year pre-COVID, a school counselor in the part of, like in Texas, uh, where I grew up at in West Texas said, hey, we need a first generation Hispanic doctor to talk to the fifth graders for Hispanic Heritage Month. And I'm like, I'm not that kind of doctor. She's like, freaking fifth graders. They don't know. I was like, oh, okay. And so, by the way, it wasn't a fifth grade classroom. It was two fifth grade classrooms, 55th graders in a gym. And I followed the firefighter. Okay. He's like, I were in the burning buildings. I'm like, feelings, right? And so like, but they were lovely, kind fifth graders. So it was fine. And so I tell what I do. I say, I'm a therapist. I say the word therapist a lot. The end of the talk, I say any questions, and I had a sharp little cookie in the front row. It's like I got question, I got question, I got question. I'm like, what's your question? What's a therapist? Freaking Rachel Maddow in the front row, man. Like, how do you answer that for a ten year old? You can't say, well, you got to graduate and then take the GRE and then go to the APA. You can't say crap like that to a ten year old. So I had nothing. How do you explain a therapist to a ten year old? Like, crap, I'm nothing. So out of thin air, I pulled the following, and it became my philosophy of therapy. So I was like, all right, who's here seeing Dumbo? And all the kids like, we seen Dumbo. I seen it. It was around the time the movie came out, I think. Point to the little girl, little girl. Can you tell everyone all where all 50 people can hear loud enough where everyone can hear? In Dumbo, what is the feather? Tell me what the feather is in Dumbo. And she says, Well, in Dumbo, Dumbo's friend gives a magic feather, that helps him fly. But his best friend's a liar. Feather doesn't help him fly. Dumbo could fly without the feather the whole time. He didn't really need it. He thought he did, but his best friend lied to him. He didn't need the feather to fly without the feather the whole time. Therapist. That's it. That's all I am. Didn't need me Dumbo to fly the whole time without me. Maybe to get off the ground that first time or two. Maybe. I don't buy that, but I'll give you that. You didn't need me. You're, I'm a feather. That's all I am. You could fly. And I really do believe that. Outside of this job, I'm Matthew McConaughey in True Detective season one. Like, I'm a nihilist. I have no faith. I think we're all doomed. We're all doomed. Like, time is a flat circle. We are mistaken. Evolution. Okay. I, I'm just, I just, that's how I feel. The only reason I have faith in humanity is our kids. That is it. Because I like now, not all my kids. Some of my kids are F everything. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you're right. But my, like, I have like a 10 year old. It's like, I still think people are good. No, they're not. People are awful. They're the worst. They're awful. Like, not all of them. Yeah, most of them. Like, and he's like, no, I think things will be okay. And I'm like, how? Like, you're freaking 10, dude. How are you doing this, man? And you have like a trauma history. And like, and basically it's like, all right, man, if you're going to show up to work, crap, I guess I'm going to show up another day, man. All right. I got your six, kid. All right. You, you're showing up. I got I to gotta represent, man. I got your six, buddy. And that's why it's like, I'm a feather. Like, they can do that. Uh, one phrase I tell my therapist, especially when they go into their first trauma case, uh, in their first narrative, I say they survive the trauma, they will survive the recovery, and so will you. That kid over there survived two years of rape, daily rape for two years. They'll survive six months of trauma there, and you will too. We'll be okay. We'll get them out of this. Okay? I had to tell one parent who was really at a, a whole low spot, she's like, I think I lost my kid, Dr. Gomez. I think I lost him. I think I lost him. And I told her something my grandfather told me, which is second to last thing I'll tell you. And I said, my grandpa used to tell me being lost is so very, very close to being found. We'll find them. That's what we do. Pretty good at it. We'll find them. Because I'm a feather because they're, they're coming back to us. We do. And last thing, and with the remaining time, short time, I apologize. We'll have questions. Do you know everyone what is the greatest gift anyone can receive in his or her lifetime or their lifetime? <clears throat> greatest gift we can receive is have a chance just once in our lives to make a difference. Does everyone on this webinar know right this moment how many times you all have made a difference? You have all made a difference enough for a hundred lifetimes. Dr. Strange speaking to Peter Parker. Last but certainly not least, as always, your zombie killing name. Well, I have been the mad double tap. Um, I don't know who's who's Susanna. Susanna, who are you? You are General Knife. Oh, that's a golden Suzanne General Knife and Joss. Oh, Joss and Storm Storm Devil. You might win, Joss. You might win. Okay, there you go. You're all done. Okay, so oh yeah, Storm Daddy. Yeah, that's a great one. Just all right, folks. Well, I want to see if there's any. I know I've tried to answer most of the questions. 
uh, that we had. I think I've missed Gabrielle, so I'll answer that real quick. Uh, said for teenagers with in, uh, intellectual developmental issues and PTSD and simple stuff like regular love from the family help them succeed, uh, better to teach them to take care of themselves. Answer is, um, why pick one? Do both. Um, and so I, I think one of the phrases I use for like families, like they're not letting me love them. And like, yeah, that's part of the trauma. Uh, part of the trauma um, is like, you don't feel like you are lovable. Um, and so old oh, phantom machete, that's a great one, Karen. And oh, general resources, oh, that's perfect. And, um, and I usually tell people, let's focus on the day-to-day -day stuff. Like if they're not, if they're not, because again, like it's hard to feel like you deserve love when you're failing your classes, getting in fights and on two hours of sleep. Uh, and so, yeah, so let's start with that basic skills like that we call the stress management. Ooh, Justine, that's a great one, storm killer. Okay, that's an amazing one. Um, so that that's what kind of be my response to that, Gabrielle. It's like, we can do both, but maybe it's the sequence. Like, like, let's teach them how to take care of themselves. And as they're kind of learning that they are lovable, because uh, that's a big, you know, kind of challenge for a lot of our kids with trauma is that they don't feel lovable. Okay. Uh, oh, Margarita, that's a great one. You are the mad knife. Okay, that that's not, that's not too shabby, Margarita. Um, so I think I got all the questions in the Q&A box. I think I'm, hopefully I got most of the questions in the chat box. Uh, any others that I missed, Jess, that you can see? Didn't see any <laughs> additional in the chat. Um, I believe you've covered them uh, for the majority that were in the Q&A. Uh, I know you were answering them as you went along. So thank you so much for that. What I want to say on behalf of all of the participants, oh, I do actually see a, qu a hand raised. So if you'd like to enter your question into the chat, we'd be happy to review that question. You can also drop it into the Q&A feature. Um, as, the, as that's going on, I just want to thank you, Dr. Gomez, on behalf of Caltrain, on behalf of the participants. Thank you so much for being with us today and bringing your energy and your expertise, of course. Uh, for anyone that does have a question, please feel free to drop those questions into the chat, or you can also drop them into the Q&A feature uh, if you would like those questions answered. I'll keep an eye on both just in case I'm not seeing them come through. All right. I'll try to answer most of them. So if I missed any, I apologize. Yeah. On my slides, folks, there are, uh, my email should be there too. So you should be able to access me. Um, oh, should I thank you? Should I? That's so nice. Uh, don't ask, educate. That's, that's the next mm -hmm. tattoo. Mm -hmm. that's, that's definitely my next tap. Um, and so, um, but yeah, and so, uh, but you had a great participation. Thank you all everyone for, because I know this is a little bit later in the day for a lot of y'all. And it's also um, not the lightest topic in, on the, and then I think sure I, I did not see any other oh so questions. I got margaritas uh any information in Spanish yes um if you go to NCTSN there is a specific resource for the all the Spanish speaking um um resource and we're trying to uh, right now we're translating a lot of our IDD uh, stuff that we had just produced into Spanish um, we have three individuals working on it who are fluent bilingual. Uh, this is the NCTSN Spanish website. There's also for TFCBT, there's a Spanish web training. Um, and that one I'll also post in the chat as well. Um, and so it's a little bit kind of harder to find, but definitely is out there because um, I think it's, um, there it is, okay. Um, and we're, we're very proud of that one. Uh, in the trauma-focused CBT, all of our materials are translated and back translated. We have uh, seven fully bilingual, I think maybe 10 at this point, trainers. And so it's spot checked and re-spot checked and re-spot checked to make sure it's linguistically sensitive, um, even with regional differences, because um, we get kids from all over the world. Um, and so um, so that, that's also another reason, thank you, Margaret, why I mentioned TFCBT is it also has a lot of resources in Spanish, and we are very proud of our Ukrainian resources now. We have uh, trained over 150 Ukrainian therapists out there. Um, and they were literally doing console calls while shells were going off. Uh, <laughs> and Dr. Manorio and Dr. Cohen were like, you can leave. And they're like, no, nah, we got this. And I was like, man, I got to get like a Stephen Covey or something. Because like excuses why I didn't show up to work. Uh, it was cold outside and I saw a spider. Those are two actual excuses I've used to not go to work. Um, so I'm like, man, got to get it together. Jess, just got to get uh, he's got to raise my game to the next level. I'm going to match our Ukrainian therapist. Right there. Self-awareness is the first start. So, that you know, that's good. Uh, for our participants, I just want to remind you that there is access to a quick survey in the chat now. 
That quick survey will also give you access to a copy of your certificate of attendance for being here. And in the next two days, you'll receive a, an email from Caltrain, which will be packed with the recording link, resources, and things of that nature. With that, Dr. Gomez, as, as usual, we just want to say thank you so much. Oh, sorry. I saw someone say that the link is not working. I'm not sure if it's the survey link because I just clicked it and it did work for me. Um, I will drop it one more time. If Oops, sorry. That is your Spanish one. I will resubmit the survey link now just in case it doesn't work. All right. And with that, we want to say thanks again. We can't wait to have you back.